Thank you, Creative Morning SF, Mafe, and also ADP List for this opportunity. So like many years ago, when I was working in Singapore, I watched a Creative Morning talk and I was like, man, I want to be there. So here I am today. Dreams do come true, people. And I am super happy. So, um, and of course, thank you so much for dialing in so bright and early on a Friday in a West Coast morning. So, um, Muffy has done a really, really nice intro of me. So I think I'm just gonna maybe skip through a little. So my title is just a fancy title. That means that I lead a team of managers and designers, develop talents and look after product verticals. So like this cute blue fella here, you'll find me wearing different hats in my day to day. I hiring manager, mentor, advocate, sponsor, ally, therapist, you know, like all managers, we are all therapists at some point and uh, product strategists and et cetera. So I'm super passionate in helping designers and women grow. Uh, one of the reasons why I mentor with ADP list and another community sister community called design buddies. And uh, one of the things that I've been doing recently, fairly recently is to advocate for inclusion and diversity. And I do have a leadership role in IND efforts within EA and also ERG groups. ERG um, stands for um, employee resource group. And the most, most, most important thing that I'm learning and doing is I'm learning to be a better ally from everybody and every day. So that's something that I'm so, so, so excited about. So a little bit of a disclaimer, legal has asked me to say this, that the information that I'm sharing today is not representative of EA, it's representative of my own views. And the second disclaimer is that I'm obsessed with GIFs and memes. So I apologize in advance that you're gonna be seeing that littered throughout the uh, presentation. The chat is open and like what Mafi said, I would encourage you to engage in the conversation by sharing your own experiences, lessons learned and advice so that you could help our community of women. And if there are allies in the group and our allies to grow in their journeys. If you have a question, please post it on Slido so that we can, you know, we can see you all upvoting it. And then we have time at the end to answer your questions. I am going to drop the Slido link. So give me one second. So there are a couple of ways to join the Slido and I'm going to put it in the link. There you go. Cool. So let's get started into like, I want to take you back to the beginning to like why this topic, right? So recently I was witness to two different incidences of a woman throwing another woman under the bus and vice versa. So in both instances, one woman was leading the other. So one incident has the reportee throwing her lead under the bus. The other incident has the lead throwing her report under the bus. These are like different groups of women. And four of these women are really, really good at their jobs, like super experienced, had a great tech record. So it was just like one of those like, okay, don't know what's happening, but let's just get to the bottom of this. And also recently, one woman viewed a senior level woman a threat to her career progression. I mean, like she shut down all efforts of collaborations, opportunities and visibility that the senior level woman created for her. This created a real world weird dynamics in the office and all of this within a year. So that got me thinking into like, if this is happening in my small group, how is this, you know, is this happening outside? And how often is it happening? So with that, I would love for um, you ladies to, um, you know, take the poll by inputting the slider address and code in your device, or just uh, taking a picture of the QR code. So what you would see is a question such as this. So I'm going to maybe give you um, a little bit of time and I'm gonna toggle between this and Slido so I could see if anyone's taking it or we could, you know, share the results together. So please, please, please um, go on Slido.com, input the code that I've dropped in the chat and um, 
probably start talking. I mean, start taking the poll. Wow. <laughs> Is that a surprising number to anyone? <laughs> so at least we have two women who have been thrown under the bus by another woman. So maybe three, including me. And then we have also, you know, some women who's been thrown under the bus by another woman. And at some point, we also have been seen as a threat to their career by another woman. So I'm going to move on and ask you the next question. Um, the next question in the poll is, in one word, please describe your feelings when that incident happened. I'm going to move to the next poll. Despondent, annoyed, uncomfortable, helpless, alone, angry, and unfair. Yes, totally. I felt totally the same thing. Um, I am going to wait a little bit more to see if you all would like to um, put in your feelings a little. I mean, I remember when I experienced it, I felt really angry and like, really like, why is this happening to me? You're supposed to be in my team, you know, and stuff like that. So, but truthfully, this was my face after each of the incidences. Obviously, I can't really show that to, you know, the women who are moderating, but that was deep inside. So I was like, you know, I mean, the pandemic does make people weird, but jokes aside, truthfully, this incident broke my heart and disturbed me really, really deeply. Just like some of you who took the poll, like right? there was anger, there was like you feel helpless and you feel like you're alone. Obviously, all of that, I felt the same, but what truly disturbed me was the fact that, you know, another woman is like not supporting the other woman. So just a little bit of a background of why I felt that way, right? So I've been extremely lucky in my design career journey so far. I'm an Asian immigrant, Indonesian Chinese to be exact, who forgets English when I'm too tired or nervous. And I've been known to rattle off in Indonesian to an English speaking audience. And that's like totally fine. So I am where I am and who I am today because of the support from other women and male allies, the opportunities they created for me, forever thankful that they leveraged their personal currency, referred and sponsored me for like those opportunities that they created. They championed me in conversation behind closed doors and not to mention also, you know, my hard work and my work ethic. I mean, sure, I didn't start in this echo chamber of support from my squad. You know, like some of you, I've been in meetings where another man was credited with my idea just because they reframed it in a more compelling way. And no one said a thing. And in the past, I have been guilty for not uplifting or supporting other women around me. But so like, like many women, Prior to these disturbing incidences, I viewed the lack of women at the top as more of a pipeline problem, not a cultural one. And I've always thought that as learning to be a better ally, like as I'm in this journey of learning to a better ally, surely other women around me are the same. Like in my naivety, I thought that every one of us have that feeling of sisterhood. Like we're working in the trenches together with the same mission. So, I wrote down a couple of hypotheses and I dug deep into the why. I spent my nights going into rabbit holes courtesy of Google search to answer this question. Like, why do we view other women as competitors? And whether they're in the same level, whether they're in the senior level, or a level more junior than us, and why do we not offer support to these women? So 
My first conclusion that I came to was that there's this imaginary narrative that explains the shortage of women at the top, that there is a quota and this quota is really scarce. So Anne Wells McNulty, who was a managing director of Goldman Sachs, wrote an HBR article that concluded, it's easy to believe that there's limited space for people who look like you at the top when you can see it with your own eyes. So let's look at some stats. Women are about half the workforce in most countries, but we hold just 24% of senior management roles, mere 3% are Fortune 500 CEOs. One in 18 women earns a six-figure salary in the US versus one in seven men. These numbers are pre-COVID. I don't want to be negative Natasha here, but the reality is that this low numbers perpetuate that false narrative of an imaginary quota at the top, and it will continue to do so if we don't do something about it. The next thing that I found out was that, you know, humans are wondrous creatures. We have amazing survival instincts. We can adapt to any situations to survive. So in the late 1980s, Robin Eli, then a graduate student in the Yale School of Management, said about trying to understand why women's office interactions sometimes turn toxic. Her hypothesis was simply that women, like all human beings, respond to the situation they are in. So long story short, her hypothesis proved true. Perhaps the most enduring takeaway was this. Women in the male-dominated firms believe that only so many of them would make it into the senior ranks and that they were vying with one another for those spots. I mean, when there are appear to be few opportunities for women, research shows that women begin to view their gender as an impediment. They avoid joining forces and sometimes turn on one another. More stats coming your way. So these are pre-COVID stats, right? So looking at the current tech landscape, 71% of women have worked in a tech company with strong bro culture. That's understandable, tech is male dominated. And about 25% of um, always, I always don't know how to pronounce this, is GAFM. So it's an acronym for Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft the biggest tech companies, only 25% of their employees are female. And we go to only 37% of tech startups have at least one woman on the board of directors. The percentage of men in board of directors is 63% and 59% in C-suite positions in tech startups. So probably that's why, you know, 90% of new startups fail because there's no women in the ranks, but I'm just kidding. So again, you know, this numbers perpetuate the mean girls or women cutting women behaviors, because remember, we are really good at adapting. Our, our responses are dictated by the situation, which is tech is dominated by males. So the third thing that I realized was that there is this fear of being penalized for lifting each other up. And according to a study in the Academy of Management Journal, senior level women who champion younger women even today are more likely to get negative performance reviews. This doesn't just happen to women, sadly, this also happens to allies as well. Because of that, some senior level women and allies distance themselves from junior women, perhaps to be more accepted by their male peers. It is important to remember though, that this is a response to the inequality at the top, not the cost. So I'm not an exec and I'm not in senior management, but I do know the reality is that the culture set by senior management and execs do trickle down to middle management to juniors. So you know, we can all connect the dots. <laughs> we know what's gonna happen next. So I bet uh, you all think that I'm not gonna go here, but I am, I'm gonna go here. So we know that we still face double standards that men don't. Lean In calls this the likability penalty. Men are expected to be assertive and confident, so coworkers welcome their leadership. 
In contrast, women are expected to be nurturing and collaborative. So when we lead or we use certain assertive or confident language, we go against expectations. And often we face pushback from men and women alike. So Laurie Rutman, a social psychologist at Rutgers University, said the posture of women for this predicament is Hillary Clinton. Remember those days? So according to the surveys, she was more popular when in office than when she was vying for office. So that blew my mind. And of course, I don't want to get political, but you know, let's remember last year or two years ago when Donald Trump was in the office. Um, the bar for behavior was dramatically lower for Donald Trump than for Clinton. And a former Vermont governor, Madeleine McKinnon, noted in the Boston Globe and said, boys will be boys, but girls must be goddesses. So that's the double standards that we are living in. The other one was a, you know, there was this study in 2020 between HBR and also a consulting firm. They found that women were on help back because of the trouble balancing the competing demands on work and family. Women were actually held back because unlike men, they were encouraged to take accommodations such as going part time or shifting internally facing roles which derailed their career. So this is a classic example of gender career paths and gender work, right? So like many entrenched organizational structures and work practices were designed to fit men's lives and situations when women made up only a very small portion of the workforce. I mean, we still are, we still do make a very small portion of the workforce. So you can connect the dots there. And lastly, I wanna talk about the pandemic. The pandemic has intensified challenges women already faced in every aspect of our lives. Women, especially women of color, have been more likely to have been laid off or for love during the COVID-19 crisis. So mothers are more than three times as likely as fathers to be responsible for most of the housework and caregiving during the pandemic. So in fact, they are 1.5 times more likely than fathers to be spending an additional three or more hours per day on housework and childcare. This is according to Women in the Workplace report. That was a collaboration within McKinsey and also Linden. So according to my friend, who's a brilliant PM and a management consultant, she said, this means that women in China work one day more a week than men. And women in India does 10 times the housework and women in the US did twice as much unpaid work, resulting in one in four women down shifting their careers or leaving entirely. So how does the pandemic impact women in the tech landscape? Um, this report from Trust Radius found that 57% of women surveyed experienced more burnout than normal during the pandemic compared to 36% of men. And a greater number of women, which is 33%, report taking on more childcare and responsibilities than men who are at 19%. Women in tech were also almost likely, as twice, sorry, as twice likely to have lost their jobs or to have been furloughed during the pandemic than men. So that's 14% versus the 8%. So more than 2.5 million women left the labor force between February 2020 and January of this year, compared to 1.8 million men. And in February 2021, female workforce participation has already dropped to 57%. This is the lowest level since 1988. And I mean, as I'm researching this and talking to you about it, I'm like feeling this dread of like, we are in the middle of the crisis, you know, of a gender diversity crisis in the workplace. And then if these trends are left unaddressed, they will exacerbate existing inequalities and reverse decades of progress that we've done toward an inclusive economy for women and people of color. 
So even pre-COVID, just to throw you more numbers, only one in five direct reports to a CEO in corporations was a woman. And then only one in 30 was a woman of color. I'm sure you are caught up with the news. So on a global level, the loss of women has from the workforce has major negative implications. The McKinsey Global Institute has estimated that global GDP growth could be 1 trillion lower in 2030 if the problem with women's employment is left unsolved. And fairly recently, Vice President Kamala Harris called this exodus of women from the workplace a national emergency. And she said, our economy cannot fully recover unless women can participate fully. So, you know, the bright side is, as the world goes back to normal, more women will head back into the workplace. All of us here have a unique opportunity. Women and allies, especially those leading teams, have the ability to show organization how we can do inclusivity right. And we can do that by simply supporting other women. I'm gonna get into the how in a minute. So before I get into the how, I'd love to ask you a question and you can take this poll by inputting the Slido address that is in the chat or on the slide and, you know, taking a picture of the QR code and I'd love for you to um, answer this question. Have you ever been supported, uplifted, mentored and sponsored by another woman? I'm going to grab some water here while I give you time to um, answer that. And we're going to see the result. Oops, not that slight is the next one. Supported 91%, uplifted 82, mentored 82, sponsored 18. I'm really, really glad that at least some of us are um, experiencing this. And I'd love to also ask you to um, describe your feelings during the experience. Empowered, yes. Many of you feel empowered. Many of you feel hopeful and then happy. And then you felt hurt, supported, and pushed beyond my own comfort zone in a good way. Awesome. So I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Um, if I get this right, the first mindset to get into, if you want to be an effective ally for other women, is we need to let go of that scarcity mindset. There's enough space at the top and enough successes to go around. If we look at the previous numbers, women don't hold nearly the amount of seats that men do at the table. That's one of that's I think one of the reason why women tend to feel this scarcity mindset when it comes to other women's successes. There is room for all of us at the table. Will we meet to scoot in closer and add a few chairs? Yeah, of course. And that's okay because it'll be cozy. And the more women at the table, the merrier it is, the stronger that table would be. The next one that I would ask you to do is check your privilege and figure out the breadth of power your privilege brings. No matter where you are in the totem pole, you will always have power and privilege. Leverage those to help other women, like show up in ways that are big and small. I'll get into the how to show up in a bit. This is something that has been really, really uh, my guiding principle in allyship do what you are comfortable with there are so many things you can do to support other women one of my mentors a male ally said something that always stuck with me as i've said earlier he said the most important thing is for you to show up in the ways that you are comfortable with because being an ally is a learning experience and no one gets it right the first time sure you know all of us are scared right because there's that penalty that fear of us being penalize. But if we start there, start with what we're comfortable with, we can slowly expand and practice. And like, you know, the old adage, 
Dutch say, you know, practice always makes perfect. So we're going to move on to the actionable how. And I borrowed um, T-shirt sizes from agile software development. So I've categorized the following example as small, medium, large. Small is something that doesn't need much commitment or something you can do with little effort. The first thing to do is have empathy. Designers, especially product or UX designers, this is what we're good at. You know, we live and breathe empathy. We try to put ourselves in other women's shoes and understand the root causes of the problem or behavior. Once we've understand that, we can work with together and we can work into looking for solutions. The second one is never underestimate the power of kindness. So I mentor with ADP lists where young designers can like schedule 30 minutes with me. I meet new people 90% of the time. I just don't have the capacity to have long mentorships. Although I would love to do that. <laughs> so there was this one of the very first sessions that I remember vividly. So I could tell this mentee is super discouraged and she's heading to a burnout. So I just begin the session by telling her that she's done a great job. She's accomplished so much and she started tearing up. And I was like, oh shoot, what did I say? Fact of the matter is that all I did was tell her that she's been doing a great job and she has accomplished so much. And truthfully, she has. So, you know, since then she has since blossomed into a more confident self. And that was the first of many similar mentoring sessions. I mean, I experienced this again and again, designers in their early career, especially women designers, being too hard on themselves and overworking without an acknowledgement of a job well done. So when you see another woman out there who seems like they're struggling, please spread, spread some kindness. Just like this morning, Val was just like, remember to take sugar. And I'm like, yes. And I felt so pumped after I killed that a scorpion. So celebrate other women's successes. Acknowledge that they are seen and their work matters. So a woman I don't know very, very well who works at EA emailed me that she's super excited about today's talk at Creative Mornings. I received that email, I think, in the beginning of the week, and that gave me fuel to get through a difficult day and for me to contribute more to the community. Another woman acknowledged the late nights I've put into rolling out a successful IND program. So if you can, in your own spheres, I encourage you to look for opportunities to celebrate other women's accomplishments and uplift them. You know, women and men respond to recognition differently. So men own their successes, we undermine ours by crediting our accomplishments as getting lucky and help for others. So as I was doing this slide, I was like, oh my goodness, that exactly what I did earlier in the presentation when I was sharing about my career design career journey. And I was like, that was what came naturally to me. So probably we need to do a little bit of mindset shift there. And I also realized one other fact that women often get penalized for promoting ourselves. The trick is lift other women up so that they can do the same for you. So it could be as easy as when you are introducing female coworkers, highlight their credentials and accomplishments. I want to also go into the next sub section, which is amplify other women. So have you heard of the shine theory? It's this idea of like, when you help another woman rise, we all shine. So if you encounter a highly capable woman, or if you see your coworker doing a great job, give them credit, tell them how amazing and great, you know, she is, tell your boss, tell your other coworkers. So at first it may seem like you're taking attention away from yourself, right? But actually you're showing that you're a supportive team player as well as an inspiring team leader and secure enough in yourself to praise others. So that is one of the benefits to celebrating women's successes and amplifying other women. The other is that it killed your, I mean, 
for me, at least it killed my own insecurity. There is something about celebrating another woman that makes you feel good about yourself and gives you that positivity and that drive to actually do better. So I want to go back to the law of attraction that says positivity attract positivity. So when you celebrate other women, other women will celebrate you. Over the years, I built a network of positive women who are my best cheerleaders. So these simple gestures are seemingly trivial, but could make a world of difference for others. The next one are the medium ones. So this is where things take a little bit of courage to do. And we all, you know, we all have that fear of being penalized, right? Because it happens so often around us. The goal for this is to show other women and allies that the more we demonstrate the behavior of being accomplices, the more these positive incidences will be formalized. So the first one to being an accomplice is to make sure women's ideas are heard. Let other women in the meeting know that you got their back. You know, sometimes you could go as far as to asking a woman who's in the same meeting if they have an idea that they'd like you to back up. There was a really nice story that I read about how women staffers in President Obama's office devised a subtle way of making sure their opinions were heard and recognized in meetings. It was so simple. Each time one woman would, take a, would make a suggestion or point, another woman in the room would speak up in support of it. President Obama, who's known as a supporter of women, caught up quickly and made it a point to solicit opinions from his women staffers more often. So meetings also provide like great opportunities for middle managers or you know for juniors to shine. I mean these I got some examples from LinkedIn. So one of the things that stuck with me was set an example, sit right front and center, where we call the power sit seats and where men usually sit. And then look for ways to shift the conversation. When a woman is interrupted, interject and say you'd like to hear her finish. I mean, it's gonna be easy for a manager, right? To say that or a director to say that. Everyone will just like go with the authority in the room or maybe, you know, someone who has credibility and who has charisma and power. When a coworker runs away with a woman's idea, remind everyone it originated with her. You can say things as simple as great idea, thanks so-and-so for surfacing it. If you see a woman struggling to break into the conversation, say you'd like to hear other points of view. When you advocate for your women or female coworkers, they benefit and you're also seen as a leader. The second thing is normalize the uncomfortable, right? So if you're a designer, incorporate inclusivity and diversity into your work. I mean, this applies to other professions too. I say a designer because my example is about a designer. So my husband creates and conceptualizes campaigns for billion dollar revenue global brand. He incorporates women of different races and sizes in his campaigns to normalize and have a real representation of women in the media. So luckily the clients bought that and that work is out. And it's like one of the things that they're trying to strive every day now. Be a mentor to other women, share your stories, share your journeys and help other women navigate the barriers and challenges they face. You know, you could guide them in how to say no to doing traditionally gendered and uncompensated tasks like taking notes in meetings or taking care of the office environment. You can help mentor women who are rejoining the workforce, coach them in how to brand themselves, review their resumes. These take really little time and you can also leverage your personal currency. This will encourage more women to do the same and let them know that they're not alone. I have more on the medium stuff and this is a little bit harder. So, Remember I was talking about the likability penalty that Lin In actually uh, you know, coined the term. So when you hear a woman called bossy or shrill, one second, oops, I'm gonna be right back. 
I have like some sort of sinus situation today. All right, sorry about that. So um, I think we are on challenge B. Yeah, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Thank you for understanding, Jocelyn. I just sometimes get the sinuses when it's early in the morning. Um, so let's challenge the likability penalty. When you hear a woman called bossy or shrill, which I have also been called in the past, pretty sure some of you have, request a specific example of what the women did and then ask, would you have the same reaction if a man did the same thing? In many cases, the answer will be no. Also, when you are having a negative response to a woman at work, ask yourself the same question and give her the benefit of the doubt. Odds are she's just doing her job. The next one, which is always, always one of the things that I really like to do is encourage women to go for it. Like we are prone to more intense self-doubt than men, like because we face an uneven playing field at work. So Lin In reported that, that this bias is so pronounced that simply changing the name of a resume from a woman's to a man's increases a candidate's hireability by 61%. That's definitely a facepalm moment there. And I can see Val doing that. Um, because the workplace is harder on women and we are harder on ourselves, this results in an imposter syndrome that chips away at our confidence. I encourage you to look for opportunities to boost other women's confidence and encourage them to go for it. We could also give women direct feedback right so women often receive less and less helpful feedback so please look for opportunities to give the women you work with input that can help them learn and grow the worst feedback that you can give or that you can ever receive and this is something that we often receive keep on doing what you did like you know how are we supposed to know what specific things that we do were successful or what was it that was that we did receive positively, right? There are closed doors that some of us are not invited to. So please, 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 please give other women that direct feedback because they are definitely not getting it for their men managers. These are the large ones. These are what I call game changers. And we've heard again and again how sponsorship create opportunities and is one of the, um, you know, factors to why some women are successful. The reality is that women are less likely to have mentors though, and especially mentors who advocate for and promote them. And this type of sponsorship is ultimately what open doors and creates opportunities because we want people who will be able to advocate for us behind those closed doors, behind those C-level exec meetings or, you know, that we're not invited to. We want someone in there to say good things about us and creates these opportunities so that we could be, you know, so that those closed doors, those people in closed doors meetings have reason to talk about us and have reason to recognize us for what we've done. Please be invested in another woman's career growth. And if you're early in your career, don't underestimate the value of your input because you may have just gone through what a woman starting out is experiencing. So I met a mentee who's real new to design, like six months, and she started holding workshops on how to use Figma and how, like, if for those of you on the call, who don't know Figma, it's like, you know, one of the softwares, prerequisite softwares that we use in product design. She is, you know, till today, one of my inspirations, like, she's so junior, and she doesn't let that stop her from having an impact to the community. And if you're more senior, 
you know, go beyond offering advice and use your influence to advocate for your mentee. Sponsorship is a great way for female leaders to reach back and help women early in their careers. And we've heard this so many times, the next one that I'm gonna to talk to you about, network, 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 and prioritize relationship building. So the basis of networking is how can one be of service to another? So put yourself out there with that mindset because there is power in relationships that extend beyond a generic introduction. When you create connections, based on shared interests and goals, you'll be more successful at your job because people want to work with people they know and they like. And you know, we talk about relationships, right? So relationship touches your heart and creates an everlasting partnership. To keep those connections, they must be nurtured. So the secret to building relationships in the words of my sponsor is make them addicted to success and make them addicted to being supported you know like bring them through the whole motion of what do those look like and what do those feel like once they're addicted once you get them there it'll be so much easier to bring them along and lastly dream big build programs or circles of support in your community you can also lead a lean in circle so if you look at LVEST, you look at women in tech communities, they all started from something small and we benefit just from being their members. Don't forget that if there is power in supporting each other at work and there's power in the pack. I wanna bring you back to Anne McNulty who was the managing director of Goldman Sachs. As she advanced in her career, she hosted women-only lunches, created open channels of communication, reached out to women who joined the firm with an open door policy, sharing advice, sharing her personal experiences. Another woman, Shelly Salas, is an entrepreneur and CEO of the Female Quotient. She founded the FQ Lounge. Both Shelly and Anne quickly realized that the lunches and the lounge was essential because it is a dedicated space for women to share challenges and successes. Most of the industries out there are siloed. So this lounge actually breaks down these barriers and let you connect with women you would have never even imagined. Then that's when the magic happened. This is the same with the employee resource groups that I belong to. I met so many women who I don't work with and all of them have great things to bring to the table. And I'm learning from all of them. Some of them have since become my mentor. Some of them have since become my champion or some of them even sponsors. So there is research that shows women in particular benefit from collaboration over competition. Study after study shows women who support women are more successful. A recent HBR study suggests that, you know, we always uh, face cultural and systemic hurdles, whether we, need, we want to rise up to leadership or whether we're just going, you know, to try to do our best for a job. And it makes it harder for us to complete or our goals or like to advance just because of that. So HBR actually suggests a way to overcome some of that hurdles is to form close connections with other women who can share experiences from women who have been there and done that. And you can, you know, talk to these women from how to ask for what you're worth to bringing your unique talents to leadership. So I am going to close this presentation with this quote by Madeleine Albright, which never really sit right well with me because she said there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women. I found one that's better. Instead of saying there's a special place in hell for women who don't help other women, let's let go of that penalty mindset and start saying there's a special place in heaven for women and allies who support other women. And this is, um, you know, I took it from Shelly Salas and added that an allies in there. So I guess I get a little bit of dips on this. 
So yeah, I'd love to hear your thoughts, experiences, and stories and questions. I'll spend a minute or two to look at the chat. 